Welcome to Stocks Review. Today we are going to take a look at Johnson & Johnson. Stock ticker symbol JNJ. It is headquartered in the USA and service regions all around the world. You may ask why we should care about where the company is headquartered? This is because companies in developed countries tend to be better regulated whereas companies in developing countries tend to have higher growth, but also more risk. Companies that are headquartered in authoritarian states also have higher political and regulation risk. The service region may give us a clue of the company's overall stability and long-term growth potential. It has a market cap of $475 billion and is considered a mega-cap company. The market cap is an important metric because companies with larger market cap often have more pricing power, liquidity, and lower failure rate, whereas companies with smaller market cap tend to have more growth potential. What sector and industry the company is in greatly influences its ability to deal with market uncertainty. It is in the healthcare sector and general drug manufacturers industry. Johnson & Johnson researches and develops, manufactures, and sells various products in the healthcare field worldwide. It operates in three segments, consumer health, pharmaceutical, and medical devices. The consumer health segment offers baby care products under the Johnson's and Aveeno baby brands, oral care products under the Listerine brand, skin health slash beauty products under the Aveeno, Clean and Clear, Dr. C.I., Labo, Neutrogena, and OGX brands, acetaminophen products under the Tylenol brand, cold, flu, and allergy products under the Sudafed brand, allergy products under the Benadryl and Zyrtec brands, ibuprofen products under the Motrin IB brand, smoking cessation products under the Nicorette brand, and acid reflux products under the Pepsid brand. This segment also provides women's health products, such as sanitary pads and tampons under the STAYFRE, Carefree, and OB brands, wound care products comprising adhesive bandages under the Band-Aid brand, and first aid products under the Neosporin brand. The pharmaceutical segment offers products in various therapeutic areas, including immunology, infectious diseases, neuroscience, oncology, pulmonary hypertension, and cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. The medical devices segment provides electrophysiology products to treat cardiovascular diseases, neurovascular care products to treat hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke, orthopedics products in support of hips, knees, trauma, spine, sports, and other, advanced and general surgery solutions that focus on breast aesthetics, ear, nose, and throat procedures, and disposable contact lenses and ophthalmic products related to cataract and laser refractive surgery under the Acubio brand. The company markets its products to general public and retail outlets and distributors, as well as distributes directly to wholesalers, hospitals, and healthcare professionals for prescription use. In short, it is a well-diversified pharmaceutical company. Its price has been quite stagnant recently, it has a five-year price return of 46% and lags the SPY. The five-year price chart may help us evaluate how a company performed recently and its ability to weather global events, such as trade war, pandemic and supply chain issues. It has a five-year compound annual revenue growth rate of 5.5%. The revenue growth is cyclical and the revenue trend looks like it is growing steadily. The revenue trend is important as growing companies often have sales go up first followed by profit growth. On the other hand, when sales become stagnant, it may also give us a hint that the growth phase of the company may come to an end if no critical change is made. The net income is growing slowly. The net income trend looks ordinary, the profit is stable, however there is no consistent growth. The net income is one of the most important metrics an investor should be aware of. In the long term, stocks always follow the earnings trend. It has been buying back some shares with shares decreasing gradually. We should always follow closely if a company is buying back or issuing more shares, as both of these activities greatly impact the return shareholders can get. 
It has a nice dividend and has been steadily growing its dividend throughout the years. The dividend history gives us a peak of a company's cash flow stability. The overall shareholder return of Johnson & Johnson is very good and significantly outperforms the historical performance of the SPY. The total return and annual growth rate history of a company can show us what the performance trend was and how it had navigated through difficult times. Most companies tend to perform similarly with a slight decline in growth as time goes by. Johnson & Johnson has a 37-year total return of 17,475% with a 37-year compound annual growth rate of 14.97%. If you had $1,000 invested 37 years ago, you would have $174,750 now. Currently, the price is at around 180 with a 52-week high at 186 and 52-week low at 115. It is near the higher end of its 52-week range. It has a P-E ratio of 24 and forward P-E ratio of 17.4. It has a cash position of 10 billion and long-term liabilities of around 60 billion. The ratio of cash debt and market cap may help us evaluate the default or bankruptcy risk and what percent of your share is eroded by debt. Higher debt also has a higher cost in an elevated interest environment. Johnson & Johnson is considered a wide moat company according to Morningstar's rating. Now, about the future projection. Currently the margin is 20.9% and future margin after 5 years is expected to be 29.2%. The margin is expected to be increasing a lot after 5 years. The company's margin in moat reflects the pricing power of the company and the projected trend is also important. We want to own a company that is able to stay profitable and relevant. It has a 5-year forecast revenue compound annual growth rate of 2.2% and 5-year forecast EPS compound annual growth rate of minus 0.9%. The near-term growth is expected to be bad. It has beaten all of analyst consensus EPS estimates in the last four quarters. Looks like it's on the right track to success. The overall analyst recommendation rating is a buy with trend shifting towards hold recently. The rating trend gives us a clue of the changes of what analysts thought about the stock. Out of 19 analyst one-year price targets, the range is 173 to 215 with an average price of 191, which is slightly above the current stock price. The discounted free cash flow model is a widely accepted method for valuing a company. Here we present three kinds of discounted free cash flow model results for a more comprehensive review. If we run the DCF perpetuity growth model, the fair price is 215 with an upside of 19.4%. If we run the DCF terminal EBITDA model, the fair price is 218 with an upside of 20.9%. If we run the DCF terminal revenue model, the fair price is 219 with an upside of 20.4%. Now we compare Johnson & Johnson with U.S. Treasuries and SPY. It cannot be emphasized more that the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield is one of the most important numbers to keep in mind when investing in stocks. The 10-year Treasury yield affects the valuation multiple of stocks like gravity, the higher it is the lower the stocks are valued, including all the S&P 500 companies and all the stocks in the world. Currently, the 10-year Treasury yield is around 2.9%. The SPY is considered one of the safest and most liquid ETF for investing in the stock market. Big funds and investors directly compare the risk and return of investing in SPY or in individual stocks. The historical return of all stocks follow the earnings trend long term, however, the real return is often reflected by a mix of dividend and buybacks together with revenue or profit growth affecting the valuation. The return yield of SPY is at around 10%. The SPY has an average forward PE around 18 now. 
Johnson & Johnson has a dividend plus 10-year growth forecast plus shares buyback yield at 4.4% and a forward PE around 17.4. We have to be cautious that this is just a rough prediction of Johnson & Johnson's future performance. The forecast can be changed at any time, and the actual revenue or net income the company is able to get depends heavily on the true market condition. Looks like Johnson & Johnson is more expensive than the SPY and SPY looks like a better buy with a more stable return estimate. We will try to summarize all the information above to give us an overall impression of Johnson & Johnson. In summary, Johnson & Johnson is a mega cap good company with little to no growth and wide moat and probably overvalued now. If you are in your retirement age and want a strong financial fortress that doesn't care about growth, it may still be a good hold long term. Now that's a review for Johnson & Johnson stock, click the subscribe button for more up to date stocks review. If you like our content, leave us a comment and click the like button to give us some support, we hope to see you next time.